So good morning, everybody, and welcome to this panel session. This panel session from Space to Earth, Investing in Downstream Applications. What we're discussing today is a mixture of these downstream applications of space technology and also investment of uh, these companies and what the trends are in general. Uh, we're having a nice panel discussion today. I've got four expert speakers with me, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction to these four speakers and we'll begin the conversations. Following the, pa the panel discussions, we'll be welcoming uh, three companies to do their pitch and who will also get feedback from our experts on the panel. So without further ado, I'd like to present to you Lorenzo Scadena. He is Secretary General at Fondazione Eamaldi. He's also the design of the first Italian venture capital fund for the space sector, Primo Space. Since 2017, he is also the Italian ambassador of the European Space Agency for the Space Solutions Network, managing the business applications and INQ Plus programs. From 2008 to 2019, he served as director general of research consortium Hipazia, deepening his background in tech transfer. A mentor and founder of tech accelerators and startups, he's an author and co-author of several scientific articles and seven patents in the field of advanced manufacturing. Raima Lineverde is an angel investor and board professional with a passion of helping startups and growth companies to fulfill their true potential. Her previous career in consulting relating to transactions, financing and law, both as a professional in a multinational consultancy and as a founder of a boutique advisory firm. We also have with us Jeff Cruzy, investment manager at Seraphim Capital. He brings more than a decade of operational venture capital experience focused around deep tech Prior to Seraphim, Jeff managed strategy at Viasat, a provider of satellite broadband and secure networking systems for defense and commercial markets. Jeff worked across a variety of early stage startups. Before becoming an entrepreneur, Jeff led climate-led tech venture investment cap capital investments of DTE Energy. And last but not least, we have Christian Zayak, an investment manager with High Tech Grunder Funds, Europe's most active early stage investment firm. Prior to jo joining HTTF, Christian held a senior engineering position at the German Aerospace Center, DLR. He maintains close ties to the space ecosystem and is advising DLR and ESA on various topics and is a startup mentor for the ESA Business Incubator Centers. He holds master's level degrees in aerospace engineering and in business economic sciences. That's our expert panel. And later on, we will be ma welcoming Max Gulder from Constellar, Pablo Giglion from Klepsidra Technologies and Eva Krusenberg from Power Up. So welcome to you all. Let me invite you now just to say a few words about our overall topic and a bit of background about your perspectives on the matter. So let me start with Lorenzo. The floor is yours. Thank you, Alicia. And um, hello, everybody. Uh, well, um, obviously, uh, as we are aware, space is uh, experiencing a significant demand share growth, as well as increasing implications in multiple downstream industries. Small nano and micro satellites make a constellation of hundreds, if not thousands, of satellites. Small launchers, Internet of Things from space, uh, commercial uh, space uh, flight for humans are creating uh, new opportunities for the industry thanks to the introduction of uh, lean manufacturing processes, vertical integration of end-to-end products and services, as for example, uh, additive uh, layer manufacturing uh, methods that uh, led to reduction in cost, weight and production time of space assets, and is the stepping stone for in space manufacturing. But, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, is the entire space value chain that is evolving, uh, with the traditional upstream-driven technology push transitioning into a market demand pool. And um, if I had to define the new space economy, I could talk about uh, four different sectors. The first one is launchers, that are basically a playground for billionaires and forward thinkers. Then uh, there's the spacecraft uh, segment, which is a growth industry fueled by failing costs where the changes are much the same as those that led to the smartphone revolution, uh, but where nowadays the reports of designing and engineering for space are still far beyond uh, enterprise electronics. 
The third sector is represented by grand uh, infrastructures. Uh, let's say making the complex simple and autonomous operation where possible. And finally, data and applications that are the real open seasons for startups where the data economy is growing around the amazing information sent back at even increasing rates from satellites and other spacecrafts. With big uh, similarities, in my opinion, with the um, artificial intelligence uh, startup economy. So the last five years have seen uh, rapid, rapid expansions of the downstream space sector, and the next uh, 10 will introduce us into a deeper revolution. Um, downstream activities all directly rely on the provision of satellite technology, signals, or data to function. And uh, in this field, uh, according, of course, with the overall uh, analysis on the topic, I see a quick evolution and rapid growth of services and products for consumers using satellite uh, capacity, such as communications, uh, satellites, uh, television services, uh, just partial products, meteorology, and new location-based uh, based services for the fintech, insurtech, food tech sectors. If and, uh, even if uh, nowadays the value creation and revenue generation are often far from the initial investments made. Uh, this is my, basically, my overview uh, about the next 10, uh, about the ne next decade for the uh, space tech uh, field. Thank you. Raima, do you have any comments, any background for your, from your perspective? Yes, thanks, Alicia, and uh, good day from my behalf to everyone as well. So, as the title says, I'm the chair of the board of FIBAN, the Finnish Business Angels Network, and my job here today is maybe take a look at from the angel investor's perspective on the space tech investing. And at, at the same time, space tech is very challenging for an angel investor, and at the same time, it's very suitable for an angel investor. And it basically boils down to two things. One is that there are a lot of capital intensive startups in the space tech and that these deep tech kind of setups they are more suited for a deep tech investor who have has deep pockets because there is a lot of funding needed until you get the get the commercial product out but also the time periods might be challenging but at the same time one of the benefits that the angel investors do have is that we invest our own money meaning that we make our own investment criteria. Whereas in VC, you have set out criteria, set out maturity. You probably need to make the exit in eight to 10 years and Angel can do whatever they like. And for example, in FIBAN, we have over 650 members, one of the largest networks, network, Angel networks in the world. It means that we have 650 investment strategies. There are those who really love, believe, that space tech is the one solving the big problems in the world. Those who can commit to those timelines, as I mentioned, from the, from the creation of the company, creation of the technology, to get it to the point where it's, where it's commercialized. But that said, that requires that not all the angels, only a very few angels invest in space tech, but they are able to be more flexible in picking up the targets. And especially when we talk about the downstream applications, it's not necessarily this long path, deep tech research to product, to technology, to market. Uh, it, it also might be that the market applications at the business is actually closer. And, and to that extent, it's very feasible startup investment as any, any other startup investment would be. Thank you. You. Christian, from your point of view for the investment funds, any comments? Yes, yeah, sure. First of all, thanks for having me today. Um, well, I would like to start with a big picture. Okay, uh, we as individuals um, use um, variables um, on a daily basis, as you know, to make um, efficient use of our own um, physical resources um, to optimize our sleep. Uh, to monitor our uh, sporting activities, to find the shortest way from A to B, 
and uh, to communicate uh, securely and uh, efficiently. And if I think about um, downstream applications, um, the required satellites um, to do that um, are the variables of our planet Earth, so to say, uh, in order to make efficient use of all the logistic uh, assets deployed uh, to exploit um, the natural resources in a more sustainable, more efficient manner. Think about fishery, think about mining, think about um, agricultural applications. And of course, it allows us to communicate um, around the globe uh, securely. And from an investor point of view, um, all the aforementioned um, applications and markets pose also in the same time um, mature and proven markets, growing markets. So it's a very attractive um, uh, area yeah, to, to invest in, but um, that has attracted also many other uh, players in the past. And as such, uh, all the aforementioned applications are, from my point of view, already uh, very crowded. And for us as investors, it becomes more and more difficult, uh, you know, to find a compelling last mover advantage to justify uh, investment in these um, crowded um, uh, verticals. So it's really like finding the needle in the haystack. Okay. And I would say the challenges are more and more with the business and value proposition side rather than uh, with a uh, tech development side, because um, technologies have been democratized, uh, access to technology is not longer an issue from my point of view. So it's, it's really about uh, the, the business side here. Yeah. And if you would ask me, okay, what are the trends and perspectives from my perspective? I think satellites as a service um, are um, potential yeah, trend in the market, which has not been uh, tapped uh, yet. Um, well, great. Thank you for all of that. That's very interesting. So I'm going to go back to Lorenzo and ask you now a little bit. Can you provide some insights as your role as the ambassador of the ESA Space Solutions Network? What are you seeing there? Uh, well, thanks for the question. And let me focus on what I see or I think should be the most uh, useful scope of the ambassador ESA ambassador network. As we are aware, sizing the global space economy is a complex uh, exercise for analysts due to the lack of uh, unified taxonomy and difficulties in setting up, uh, let's say, borders. The same borders uh, between space and non-space activities are often blurred and uh, hazy, leading to different ways of assessing the overall space economy. This is specifically critical when uh, setting the borders, boundaries between uh, the downstream space industry and the end user economy. As we move down the value chain and the assessment of the direct casual relationship between the space industry and the benefits brought to end users become complex to isolate and um, uh, measured in an accurate way. The same difficulties in understanding the space phenomenon and its scope on uh, all industrial sectors, uh, but in particular for the downstream sector, are experienced by mm, mm, investors. Um, not, mm, I, I want to say about, I want to, to talk about uh, venture capital investors, but traditional investors, uh, traditional industries, and the same end users even if active in sectors close to the opportunities uh, that space can offer. This is um, our first task as ambassador in Italy, um, at least, uh, by promoting the activities and programs of the European Space Agency. We also act as translators and, uh, and connective tissue between the space and non-space industry, uh, facilitating the understanding of uh, internet connectivity and the proximity between industrial sectors that are only apparently distant and um, facilitating, let's say, both through cultural diffusion and with specific action, let's say, um, courses or um, call for ideas, uh, the relationships between uh, SMEs and traditional industry so that it could uh, become uh, first a user then, and then a customer. Um, given the accelerating trends in uh, digitization affecting all parts of the economy, the very structure of the space industry could uh, undergo future changes with new challenges 
to our account. This is our second task to our uh, space and as means to promote market-oriented services trying to satisfy new needs and create new value chains with uh, mm, horizontal integration and not only the vertical ones uh, that are traditionally provided by the oligopoly approach of the system integrator towards its customers slash suppliers helping in a venture building perspective um, companies especially um, smes to qualify as well as for the space market where they are maybe already good on their own for the mass market and then comes the third the third task helping the creation of an ecosystem of the space sector and uh, that knows how to open the sector for to forms of uh, financing and co-financing of space activities that know how to overcome the logic of relying only on public funds. Monitoring and measuring private investment uh, is challenging, of course, but the, the existing data show that their volume is much lower than, uh, than that of public funding and this must absolutely change if you want uh, volumes to produce the avalanche effect that can change market metrics. I can't hear you anymore. I don't know if it's just my problem. Okay, me. Okay. <laughs> so thank you, Lorenzo. And I'd just like to turn, the, I was saying that I'd like to pass the floor to Jeff so we can hear a little bit from him. We've seen a lot about SPACs at the moment, about young space companies going public. Do you think the SPAC mania is good for the space segment? You're now on mute. Yeah, so um, I think it's helpful to first sort of understand some of the macro drivers, um, <clears throat> namely um, that you know, low interest rates are pushing people away from paper and, and towards equity investments. Um, so they're, they're seeking returns um, more in the equity market. I like to characterize some of it also, not, not all of it, as something of a Robin Hood effect. So we're also seeing a lot more retail investment in the space sector as well. Um, probably part of the hangover from people missing out or feeling like they missed out on SpaceX. So, so um, there's that. And then, um, but I think, you know, more importantly, um, SPACs are pretty well aligned with space tech more broadly in that, you know, big long-term visions requiring lots of capital for the most part. And so that, that a SPAC vehicle is particularly well suited um, in, in that sense. Um, so I think, you know, it, it, it works well for the space market in that, it can bring a lot of the much needed capital that might not be, um, you know, be able to be derived from the venture community itself and why we see, you know, much larger financial institutions uh, getting involved now. Um, but, you know, we need to be cautious. Uh, we don't, we don't want to ruin this for other companies. So I really encourage, you know, only, you know, the most vetted and progressed space tech companies listing. I, I'm not a big fan of very early stage unproven companies without much of a track record. Um, so what, what things like uh, that I like to see are, you know, companies that already have flight heritage, companies that have a strong, you know, reasonably strong pipeline of well-known paying customers, um, not, not full of startups and, and, and not full of, um, you know, a backlog that, that's just not material. Um, so I think that, that that's what's important to me. Great, really interesting. Christian, do you have any thoughts? Uh, how would you classify this development and the significance for the new space economy with the... Yeah, first of all, I would like to say I agree uh, totally with uh, everything what has been said by Jeff. Um, I mean, uh, first of all, it's a positive development uh, for the um, space industry and especially for young uh, space companies uh, because uh, finally they arrive um, in the financial tech mainstream, so to say. Yeah? But, uh, and if you think about um, the discussions we had over the last years, it was always about, okay, we miss exit opportunities, attractive exit opportunities yeah, for, for early stage investors, having invested in a space tech, yeah, and asking uh, themselves, okay, uh, uh, to whom will we sell the company? Yeah? Who will be the buyer? Yeah? Uh, is an IPO an option? Yeah? And um, as such, I, I really welcome that development, but as correctly said by um, Jeff, um, we'll be uh, really 
and I'm very pleased uh, to see um, companies going public with you know a mature um, business model, a proven business model with with um, uh, products uh, which have demonstrated that they work yeah, in the relevant environment yeah, and not just with sketches and uh, concepts. Yeah. And I'm at the same time a little bit worried yeah, um, that setbacks uh, basically um, by individual companies could negatively affect the entire ecosystem. Yeah? And my hope is that um, all the investors around are wise enough to differentiate uh, between these companies, yeah? because otherwise all the progress we made, we achieved, yeah, would uh, then be um, at stake and at risk. Good. Uh Raima, would you have any thoughts on this from your perspective of the investment? Yeah, yeah so I, I, I agree with uh, both Jeff and uh, Christian before. So I think that overall having this, so one is that there's a tons of money looking for returns and we need new channels to get those on the markets and SPACs are one of the channels. And uh, if we can get that funding to the space tech on later stages, it also means that the funding in earlier stages becomes easier. So the challenges that this market has had is that if I look at uh, as an early stage investor a case, I make returns either by selling the company or some very rare cases that it becomes turning business and get generating revenues. For both of those cases, I either need to assess the whole trip until the exit or at least until the next investor, who then needs to think about the next investor, who then needs to think about who buys it, as, as Christian said. And uh, the more money we get on any phase of this funnel means that more fluent it will become on the other funnels. So more fun money we have on the later stages, it becomes easier for the earlier stage investors, because now they know that, okay, there are companies who will finance the next step, there are companies who will buy this kind of company. So from uh, from venture capital investor point of view, that starts working. Great. So can I ask now, Lorenzo, can you tell me a bit more about the landscape of finance for innovation, specifically in Italy? I know you have experience in... Uh, yes, I will try. <laughs> well, the European Green Deal uh, initiative is expected to stimulate the demand for advanced satellite-based applications in the EU member states and of course Italy for the next uh, decade. And we try, we must try to prepare companies to seize the opportunities that uh, the alternative finance sector, especially in this moment of zero rates, can offer. Um, this also means a lot of training for companies to avoid them fall falling prey to those who do not play for them, but who attract them with the promise of um, design growth and then harness them, but also overcome uh, ancestral uh, shyness, uh, ignorance, and the habit of remaining in comfort zone uh, dictated by the traditional method of public financing of space activities. In this sense, uh, the downstream sector is the most ready, uh, in my opinion, and current evidence shows and uh, unprecedented and growing investments from angel and venture capital funds in space startups and newly established companies and just read any report to, refer, to verify how the, the trends are constantly grow, growing even uh, though uh, there are still large exits that will give a boost at least um, psychological to the market. Uh, in this sense, uh, we wanted as foundation to design, promote and enable the first Italian venture capital fund dedicated to the space sector uh, called Primo Milio and today, of course, managed by a management company making the first investments. Uh, the first closing was in July 2020 and uh, others will born, I hope, certainly more sectorial than a generic fund for space tech in the coming months. But beyond the establishment of new funds, there is still a lot to do. I mean, uh, the involvement of the industrial system, the ecosystem through the interventions of uh, corporate venture funding funds, which in Europe should fulfill the role of American billionaires, um, the creation of uh, and uh, strengthening of uh, tools that uh, intervene in the areas of market failure. Uh, enhancing what in Italy the government has begun to do with the National Innovation Fund and uh, a new foundation called the Neatec, 
uh, limiting the so-called value of that. And uh, also financial support tools um, of uh, SMEs, uh, a space for large industry with a view to open innovation. In this sense, as foundation, we were we are working uh, um, starting from the agro tech, energy, and insure tech uh, sectors, and uh, let's see in the future. Um, I, in, in my opinion, sustained access to finance will remain a challenge for most uh, established and new players in this sector. The intensification of international competition, the acceleration of the launch of new technological solutions, and the appearance of newcomers. Uh, with still unproven business models continue and we continue to characterize the investments prospects and uh, will orient the challenges of the space ecosystem over the next decade. But I truly believe in this uh, adventure. Okay, well, certainly we'll keep our eyes on that and see how it progresses. Christian, do you have any point, for any comments from your? Well, uh, we see a lot of movement also here in Germany, uh, um, in uh, the new space area. Uh, and <laughs> what shall I say? Um, it took us a while um, uh, to, to pick up the pace. Uh, but uh, now the, the movement here in Germany um, developed a certain momentum. Uh, and now it's it's going. Uh, and, and all the companies um, and um, all the investors around uh, want really to, to uh, make this happen and to succeed. So, so I, I think we are really at a very interesting inflection point, yeah, um, um, investment-wise and uh, in broader sense for for tech that that all the interests are aligned, yeah, and and uh, we should really take advantage of it, yeah. And as such, I'm uh, also pleased that uh, the missing puzzle piece, so to say, was um, also added uh, with with this exit or spark element, yeah. So, so I would say uh, all lights are green, yeah, <laughs> in Germany at least. Yeah, uh, there are still uh, things uh, we need to address, uh, but I, I think um, we we have um, filled all the gaps, starting with the seed investment, the Valley of Death, um, um, following by by later stage investments uh, up to the exit scenario. Yeah, so so. Um, all these um, stages are now addressed and, and uh, we need to maintain the sort of cycle. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Can I now pass the word to, to Jeff to maybe follow up on this and, and perhaps also taking it into some advice to some early stage startups in deep tech and what you might say for them? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think um, one, one thing that I love about Europe is there's no shortage of talent technical talent. Um, I think, you know, it's also, you know, kind of that arbitrage at this point with, um, you know, the United States, for example, you can get better top tier talent cheaper than you can in the US. What I think we are lacking and what I encourage many of these, you know, what I would consider deeper tech startups in space um, to, to learn how to do better is really understand how to tell their story, refine their narrative, because it is more often than not a very long-term vision for a lot of these companies. And it's important, more important for these companies than, you know, um, than your typical SaaS uh, play to really be able to convey the long-term vision to potential investors. Thank you, Jeff. Perhaps Raima, uh, do you have any tips in general about building business or any structural issues or anything that yeah. you'd like? Yeah, I think I, I uh, continue on what Jeff said about the vision and storytelling. So so one is really to build vision what you want to achieve, but that vision also should, should translate uh, into business at one day. And there it comes what Lorenzo said, that you need to have a business model. At least you need to be able to build a business model. Otherwise, it's not an investment case. And uh, that I think that a lot of these deep tech teams, they love their technology and they build greatest solutions, but you need to have match the solution with the problem that it solves and somehow monetize based on the uh, problem that you're solving. It doesn't matter, in, for instance, that if you gather all the data in the world, at that point, the data is not valuable. The data only becomes valuable when it's used and preferably used in some manner to solve a problem that is really, really used. And I think that here lies the biggest opportunities 
in the in space tech. Uh, it enables us to solve the kind of problems, the major problems that we are having in this world that no other solution can address on a same level. We are, we are talking about, for example, climate change, how there's enough food for the people and, and things like that. So if you know your vision, what you want to solve, then you can also translate that to a ma language that how it is a business. On top of that, you can build the business model. And at that point, you can attract investors. Uh, if, if it's a research driven project, if it's research only, it, it, it goes more to the public funding than private funding. But if it really generates something uh, uh, that, uh, that translates to value, then it becomes an investment case and then it fits for private funding. Yes, great. Christian, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, uh, definitely. Um, first of all, uh, I totally agree with Raima and uh, that matches also my observations um, dealing with um, space um, tech startups. So, so they quite often really fell in love with their technology yeah? and maybe it's a German thing. Yeah? We have this uh, uh, out of engineering, so to say, yeah? which defines uh, our... Yes. And, and uh, that is really good, but uh, also very bad in the same time, because you have to focus on speed and you have to focus on the real customer needs. Yeah. And, and um, that is uh, something um, what, um, yeah, where I see um, room for improvement for, for our um, uh, teams here in Germany, uh, maybe also in, in Europe. Yeah. And here we really need to catch up. But I would also like to comment on uh, the statement um, by Jeff um, with regards, you know, to tell the narrative yeah it's a very important thing yeah but um here we have to um understand there are some cultural differences yeah and there, they still exist between uh, basically the landscape in the us when it comes to investors yeah and uh, when it comes to uh, basically the, the government anchor customers etc and uh between what we see here in europe and and what i would love to see is you know uh, more visionary more bold approach also on the governmental side yeah, when it comes to these new technologies yeah uh, because of course at the end of the day we can only invest uh, in, in startups where we see a viable commercial business case but if we want to push these boundaries further yeah we need to have uh, anchor customers yeah and they uh, come uh, traditionally from the governmental side, whether it's, um, you know, about civil applications or military applications as in the US uh, quite uh, often, uh, but, uh, but we need to see that. Yeah. And we should uh, assure uh, that we do not yeah, constantly fall behind yeah, what's going on in the US because it's uh, predictable where the next uh, moves are going to yeah, and, and what will come next in the US. And we should not be surprised yeah, that we have another cloud moment, so to say, or internet moment, yeah, that uh, we are surprised that a new industry uh, was built up, yeah, out of a sudden, it's not the case, yeah, it's already visible and, and we should, um, yeah, try to, to leapfrog them, maybe. Maybe, Jeff, you'd like to follow back up um, from Christian, and also I'd like to tie that in with the question that we have here in the chat. Because which says open end fund for space tech companies are increasing, especially in the USA, where special ETF are launched. Uh, what do you think of this new tool for investors and how do you see Europe in this trend? So I think uh, what we're starting to see are, are more interests on the public markets um, more broadly in Europe. Um, there's a number there's a number of SPACs in the work. I think one was recently announced by Lakestar. Um, so um, but in regard to um, to ETFs, I think you know it's a little bit challenging right now to gain exposure, particularly to the, the new space companies. Um, there are plenty of uh, more traditional operators that that you know can be part of that ETF that have you know some some percentage of their of their business that ex is exposed to space, but um, oftentimes more in the traditional sense. Um, I think sure it's it's a great financial instrument for people to to sort of try and diversify across. Um, a, a certain industry. Um, I, I think you know it, it can be good in some sense for for, for new space in that um, it's helping people more broadly gain exposure um, <clears throat> through their investment. Um, but also at the same time, they can be sort of a boon because 
you know, the volatility of a startup or an earlier stage company that's listed um, doesn't play well in terms of uh, the, the share value of an ETF. And um, large movements in, in the share value of a single company can oftentimes send an ETF in a downward spiral pretty rapidly. Um, and and that, that's just not what we need at this point. So I think, again, it kind of comes back to, to the notion that we need to be very selective about the companies that are listed publicly. Um, and, and that definitely feeds into the, the, the ETF side of things. Thanks, Jeff. Can I just ask the audience if there are any questions, then please do add them here in the chat or questions. We're coming to towards the end of this panel discussion. We'll be moving on to our pitch sessions. But I'd like to ask Raima if he has any further thoughts on... Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe one comment. Skipping the ETF part, but focusing on the open end fund part, this is actually actually a question question to uh, re really Europe because uh, a lot of our VCs and also also private equity funds are closed end typically ten year funds, and uh, it's of course selects the startups to certain extent that with startups you can make a feasible exits in in ten years. Some some you need to exit too early, some take too much time, and really a question that does this uh, setup where we have sort of a standard of having these closed and 10-year funds direct in certain way the startups that do get funding in Europe. Okay, so I don't see any further questions here. So what I'd like to do is ask each of you, the four panelists, just to in line with these pitches that we're going to be asking our companies to do shortly, just say a couple of words in, in say uh, a minute, just to summarize your thoughts on this, both bringing it back to the main topic of the the trends in, in downstream applications of space tech at the moment, as well as for investment. So um, I will start back with Lorenzo. Let me know what you On mute, please unmute. Thank you. No, you're still on mute. No, perhaps we'll we'll move on to no, we'll move on to Jeff perhaps, and then we'll come back to you, Lorenzo, in a moment. So um, one of the things that um, you know, bringing it back to downstream applications that I always look for are not just um, you know people that are running machine learning models on data streams. I'm looking for people that are running machine learning models on a variety of different data streams to create their own proprietary insights. So looking downstream. Um, I, I really, I really want companies doing unique things with not just space data, um, but also terrestrial data um, to, to to do a variety of things. Um, but also making sure that these companies um, are are keen to verticalize, um, because oftentimes, you know, just selling a data stream doesn't really get move the move the needle for for the industry. It's really being able to to capture the value chain um, at this point. Thank you. Uh, Christian, 30 seconds, summarize. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, um, go for it. It's the best time ever to, to start a, a startup in, in this uh, ecosystem. But uh, the important thing is, um, okay, um, don't think about uh, the moment. Uh, think about the next five years or 10 years. What will allow you to build a sustainable business, not just in the moment? Yeah. Uh, so, so you have always to stay ahead of the competition, uh, business-wide, technological-wise, uh, because uh, that is usually the period we are invested in, yeah. And we want to have, uh, yeah, a successful business, yeah, also in in three, five, or ten years from now on, yeah. And this should be uh, shown to us. Thank you. And while we wait for Lorenzo to come back, Raima, your thirty. Yeah. So I think overall this discussion and what we've seen over the past years. Uh, underlies that uh, in, in space tech investing, we are now now in a phase where there has been some early adopters, but now we are moving to early, uh, early maturity. So meaning that this is probably the best time to have a space tech startup, because there will be, in a moment, when you will be raising the big rounds, will be the moment when everybody is fighting about the chance to get into the space tech. Wonderful. Okay, so... What I'd like to do now is just move on to our next part of the session, which is where we will invite other winners of the Space Up, the European funded project. 
uh, the winners of our space up ev pitch evaluation to present their companies. We have these three companies with us. You will each have three minutes. And I'd like to invite Emanuele, my colleague from, he's from IBAN, but colleague in the Con Space Up Consortium. There he is. He will be your time <laughs> controller. So when he says 30 seconds, that is your warning. We would like to keep you um, on time, please. So without further ado, I would also like to mention to the audience that you can uh, ask questions. There will be time to have the, that at the end and our panelists will give a little bit of feedback after each pitch. So first of all, I would like to welcome Max Gulde from Constellar for your pitch. The floor is Hello, a quick question. Can you see my screen? Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, excellent. So then I'll go ahead. How do we sustainably feed 10 billion people on this planet? And how can we do so without more agricultural land in the face of water scarcity and under changing climatic conditions? My name is Max, I'm the CEO of Concilla. And Concilla will provide precise temperature data to enable smart irrigation in a globally scalable way because smart irrigation is the key tool to combat the impending food gap. Today, farmers increasingly make use of smart farming services to increase yield while saving water. Those smart farming companies, in turn, base their insights more and more on satellite imagery to daily monitor 1.5 billion hectares of global cropland. However, current satellites rely on leaf color to determine crop health and can only provide information when plants have already started to wither. Using our patent pending architecture, Constellar will operate a swarm of infrared monitoring microsatellites to robustly detect changes in crop health days to weeks earlier than ever before from space by measuring plant transpiration instead. And this substantially reduces the risk of crop loss while saving 40% of irrigated water. It does not require any hardware in the field and is around 30 times cheaper than drones or weather stations, making it affordable for the developing growth regions of food production. Booming at 20% annual growth, the commercial Earth observation data market in agriculture will surpass 2 billion euro in 2028. In this market, Consular will provide subscription to temperature monitoring via our online data platform, which sees first smart farming companies already signing on right now. Having received more than 20 letters of support across industry, we have modeled an initial business opportunity of 152 million US uh, sorry, uh, euro in agriculture alone by 2028. And in this market, we are confident to win out because all our competitors are already compromising on at least one of the core customer requirements. And this will make us the only provider of temperature data with the precision, the quality, and the affordability to conquer this market. As a company, Consular focuses on three aspects. The R&D to build the space segment, the development of our data delivery platform, and a commercial team for business development. In the past six months, supported by key personnel from the European Space Agency, we have grown from four to 15 engineers, scientists, and business developers from leading European organizations. And together, this year, we will go from lab to space. Via Fraunhofer, we have signed a launch contract for the first system in space 12 months from now, the first amongst all our competitors. We've also just closed a 1 million euro pre-seed funding round, including a strategic space investor, OHB, giving us a 50 months runway. In April 2022, we will raise 50 million euro to build and launch the first commercial thermal infrared constellation within 18 months. And I would be very much excited to have you on board for that. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Can I ask any of our panelists to have any comments or feedback? Um, I have a quick question. Um, I was wondering, um, can, <clears throat> can you share with us a little bit more about uh, the development of the constellation? Is that being all developed in-house? And, and what is, what is the, uh, the capital requirement to, to launch the full constellation? Yes. Um, so it is not development house. We're outsourcing everything except for the IP needed. So basically the user segment in, in space terms. Um, so OHB is providing the pilot, for example, none of is providing the bus and we have other subcontractors to provide um, all the other bits which, which are needed. We do not produce everything in house because we simply don't have the manufacturing capabilities. A cost of a single satellite, including three years of operation downlink and everything, uh, including the ITU filing frequency and so on, is around 2.6 million euro at the time. I think this can change plus minus 10%. We would need four satellites to serve globally 1 million square kilometers. 
So with 50 million euro from today, we would be able to um, start the first batch of the constellation to basically serve the global um, area every single day. We would need somewhere around 28 to 35 satellites. Thank you. Any other questions from the panel? Yes, I have one question or two questions. Um, first of all, Max, um, um, how do you uh, reach your end customers and who are your end customers, by the way? Okay, is this are these the two questions already? Or? Yes. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, the end customers are companies providing insights for farmers. Mm -hmm. um, prominent example, for example, is uh, Farmers Edge, but it's also companies like Planet. Um, Bivar is a, one of our anchor customers, a data processing company, sub company, uh, daughter company, Vista in this case. And so we're not directly speaking to the farmer, but we're providing the foundation data for Agriculture 4.0 um, for those companies to then. Um, deliver the insights uh, to the farm. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you. And um, if anyone has any further questions, please do leave them in the chat or in the question tab and we'll make sure to pass them on. But for now, I want to make sure we have enough time for our next company. So I would like to invite Pablo Guilino uh, from Clepsidra Technologies. Welcome, Pablo. Yes, hello. Your three minutes will begin, and uh, Emanuele will be on your time watch. Okay, so thank you very much for this opportunity to present our company. Uh, I am the founder of Clopsidra. Uh, my name is Pablo Guillino. We are a Swiss startup, and what we do is uh, onboard uh, computing software with three main benefits. We do a software that is able to process up to eight times uh, more data on board in real time. Secondly, we can do this with less power consumption, up to 50% less power. And thirdly, and uh, more importantly, we do any hardware upgrades or any cloud resources or anything else. We do this just by means of upgrading the software, which uh, make it very uh, attractive in terms of adoption to, to our clients. So why are we doing this? There is a growing need to perform more tasks on the edge or on board in the case of a space. In fact, there is a prediction that by 2025, 75% of all data will be produced and processed at the edge. So this is a lot of data. Uh, however, uh, there is a well-known uh, computer science problem that uh, when there is a certain degree of uh, parallelization in data process uh, in computers with limited power, uh, computers tend to saturate. Uh, not necessarily at the 100% at the of the CPU, but computer saturates. Uh, this problem, however, was solved in another industry in particular in the investment banking industry. We have a background of, as a developer for over uh, 12 years. I, I was uh, very fortunate to work with some of the top uh, development uh, development uh, teams in, in, in the world. Uh, and I learned some techniques that can get rid of this problem. In particular, this is exactly what Clepsidra is able to do. We uh, remove this saturation curve and, and make available a more linear uh, processing uh, approach uh, up to the physical limit of the computer. That means, that our software is able to convert a small computer inside a satellite, a car, etc., into a much bigger computer, four times more power processing, just by means of software. So why are we doing this? Why not just um, upgrade the computer? Uh, well, in a space, it's well known that you cannot just upgrade a computer. This is extremely costly. And even sometimes a computer with the requirements may not be available for a space uh, for radiation hardened. And then sometimes it's just a software issue. Even, even when the, you upgrade a computer, the problem doesn't go away. The good news is the sectors affected by these situations are the biggest sector and most uh, fast growing sectors in the world. Uh, now going back a little bit to the products, we have two products, one for general data processing <coughs> with these particular features. Uh, in, in the case of a space, it can be applied to a number of different uh, scenarios from data uh, compression, to telecoms, to and, and more importantly as well, to navigation and image processing. We have been benchmarking our product, and we have clients using this product, especially computer manufacturers. Uh, we have been receiving requests by several computer manufacturers, including Intel and, and, and other big uh, players, to evaluate our software uh, with their uh, computers. This is uh, the main uh, traction we have with the SDK. Then we have recently Second. released a new product for artificial intelligence. As you can as you can see here, our product is extremely fast and more efficient than other solutions in the market. Uh, we apply especially to, to, to space in the areas of navigation and also in telecom. 
Uh, our approach to market is, is a threefold. Currently, we are working in the defense and robotic sector. Mid-time is a space. We are receiving a massive traction. And long-term is automotive, where we have a, we, we need to certify our product before uh, applying uh, our software there. So in, in a nutshell, what we are doing is uh, apply some of the fastest uh, software techniques available in the world uh, and bringing them to the onboard systems. We believe that our software, like other companies in the past, uh, have uh, will will change the landscape of data processing in, in these sectors. We have a very good pipeline of clients uh, that is, is growing and growing. And we're currently looking for either pilot projects with a space company, but also we are running a seed investment round. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. So any feedback, perhaps Raima, any questions, any comments? Yes, thank you, Pablo. Uh, very interesting case. Uh, a sm small feedback. You're probably doing software, yet you had one slide that says you are making it small edge computers. So somebody might get confused uh, whether you're doing software or hardware. Uh, two questions, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, one is that, what is the current status of your company? Do you already have paying customers? And second, that what is your competition? What is what are your main competitors? Yes, so yes, we have paying clients. Um, we also have received a pre-seed investment and uh, also some other grants. Uh, all in all, around half a million. Um, and uh, in regard to your second question, uh, um, second question was the competition. So who are uh, yes. your main uh, competitors? Yes, the competitors, we can split it in two parts, the hardware competitors and the software competitors. Uh, hardware competitors are companies producing uh, accelerated hardware, uh, like NVIDIA or, 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 or FPGAs in Silings. They're not really competitors because we plan to increase our roadmap. In our roadmap, we have integration with these boards to accelerate them even further. And then we have the software uh, companies like uh, MATLAB, uh, ROS, uh, and, and, and many others, but either they rely on the cloud to accelerate or they require a massive software upgrade, uh, changing the whole uh, software solution of the client. So they are uh, either too costly to adopt because of software or require a hardware upgrade. Well, we, we, we keep uh, the hardware as is and we have a low adoption process. This is the main uh, differentiation of our software. Thank you, Pablo and Raina. So I would like to uh, allow Ivar Krusenberg a moment on the screen from Power Up to present the company. Welcome, Ivar. Emanuele will be timekeeping for you. Uh, can you hear me? No? Yes, but you're sharing the wrong screen. You're yes, sharing. Okay. Really good. Um, so, my name is Ivar Krusenberg. No, no, you are of... sharing. Can you hear me? You are sharing the wrong screen. That's okay. it now. You are sharing um, your um, browser. Okay. Um, Let's try again. Okay. So can you One see my second. screen? Now we can see your PowerPoint presentation, but it's not full screen. Good. Yes, it's fine now. Thanks. Good. Um, so my name is Ivar Krusenberg. I'm CEO of Power Up Energy Technologies, and we are manufacturing smart electric generators. Our first pitch at market is the sailing market, and that's how the sailors are, are visualizing the sailing experience. However, uh, it's quite often that even if they have a two generators on the boat, uh, both of these fail in the middle of the ocean. So they have a lot of issues with the maintenance and corrosion. Uh, also, the batteries have been proven to be too heavy for uh, many applications, including maritime. So besides these diesel generators and the heavy batteries, there's also other alternative technologies like uh, solar panels and wind turbines. But these also have been proven to be uh, too weather dependent and often not reliable enough. And that's why we came out with this uh, smart electric generator combining lithium ion batteries, super caps and hydrogen fuel cell into one small portable box. Um, our generators are really nice and compact. Uh, they are below 10 kilograms um, and also the size of the small toolbox. Uh, besides that, they're silent, uh, zero emission, and they're really powerful. You can charge everything you need on your boat or everywhere you need. Uh, also, uh, in comparison to the best uh, battery technology on the market, they're more than 10 times lighter. 
obviously we are not the only one on the market, but our generators are more than twice powerful than for the competitors. And uh, the market is not limited to the maritime. It's also uh, telecommunication market, military, um, camping cars, um, also off-grid homes. And most important also today, uh, the space. Uh, we see a lot of uh, opportunities in the space exploration missions, and we are collaborating uh, quite closely with the European Space Agency. And by using vertical business model, we really expect within five years to get to the 70 million in revenue. And the biggest market barrier is the hydrogen, but we have been working now for years on the hydrogen strategy of ours, and we have figured out how to get the hydrogen for this type of electric generators. And how we can make it because of our unique IP and also the secret sources, and obviously the team with really variety of skills. And as you can see, our team is also quite diverse. Um, and uh, also the advisory board with some big names, uh, including Albert Chu and Digby McDonald, uh, who have been no uh, also nominated to the Nobel Prize. And uh, we are currently looking for 600,000 euro in investment, which we are matching up with some soft money. And this goes to, to the additional IP uh, management uh, and, and also to scale up the sales, marketing, and also the production. Uh, so. If it works in space, it works everywhere. This is our motto. I'm happy to answer to any questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lorenzo, I don't know if you have figured out your mute button, <laughs> which is the problem, um, whether you have any comments, perhaps? Any other comments? I can't hear Lorenzo. The mute is obviously stuck on, unfortunately. Um, any comments from the rest of the panel? Yeah, I have um, two questions. Um, Eva, thanks a lot for your presentation. Can you elaborate a little bit on your um, TIL level and uh, on, on the traction? Uh, so basically, we launched the sales uh, in, in December, uh, so we have made the sales and uh, even uh, even yesterday uh, we, we closed another another patch of uh, generator sales. Um, so uh, we are generating uh, the traction right now, but we have it. Um, and, um, and also then um, the second question you had was about the technological readiness level is uh, currently uh, depending on the on the product because uh, as i said we have the vertical business model so we are developing our own fuel cell stacks uh, in this sense uh, we are uh, between uh, five uh, and and six right now um, and then uh, for the close cathode stack it's uh, it's between three and five uh, and the generators, uh, the up 400, for example, this is um, is quite high. We are currently in process of certification, um, and we are developing also bigger uh, six kilowatt uh, generator, for example. And this DRL level is uh, at four right now. Okay. Great. Thank okay. You. Thank you. you are and given the time, I'm afraid we don't have um, any space for any further questions. As I say, if you'd like to send us a, a message, then we will be able to pass them on to our panelists. So I would like to thank you all for your time today, with special thanks to our four panelists, Lorenzo Scatena, Raima Lina Virta, Jeff Krusey, and Christian Ziap. And thanks also to our three companies, and congratulations, wishing you all the best on your journey for investment and progress. So we have Constellar, Clepsydra Technologies and Power Up. I've been Alicia Shelley from IASP representing Space Up in this session. I hope you all enjoy the rest of the, the Paris Space Week sessions and we'll see you all in some other event online soon. Thank you. Bye bye.